Good afternoon, I'm your host, Don Burgess. Uh, welcome to this Facebook Live presentation, Post Budget. And I have very, three very distinguished guests with me today. Cordell Riley, who's a researcher analysis of an institution that for uh, Bermuda College. I butchered that a bit, but, right. <laughs> but he's, he does a lot of work with statistics, so he can mm -hmm. crunch some numbers for us. Also at the Bermuda College, Craig Simmons, welcome. Um, lecturer in economics, and uh, people always seek your advice. They don't always take it, but... Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Cheryl Pack Packwood, who used to be the representative for the Bermuda government in Washington, D.C., um, head of a telecom in Africa, head of business Bermuda, uh, and multiple other assorted things. And, and as a lot of people like to say, the smartest uh, woman that, that we know, degree from Harvard and Yale, so uh, hmm. welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, we'll start out with something that a, a, that a lot of people can really uh, relate to to begin with, and that's the land tax increase on ARV. Um, uh, the two lowest bands, no percentage, but there's going to be a $300 uh, base charge, which continues all the way up to the highest band. The two middle bands, no increase, and then to the three highest bands, um, some increases. Uh, how do you think that's been taken by the community so far? Anyway. Well, um, there has been uh, some concerns at the lower end. Um, there are some who have been paying, I think, around about $88. And so with the reduction uh, of the elimination of the base rate and then just a flat fee, they're going to see their um, bottom line more than double for their, mm -hmm. their land tax. Now some might say $120 is not that much more, but if I'm at the low end and I'm already struggling, uh, anything you take from me, um, I'm going to feel it. So uh, there's some concern at the lower end. Right. It, it's $220 more, right? Yes, about that. Yeah. Oh, what did I say? Yeah, you said $120. I think. Yeah, 220 yeah. 220 So I, I don't do statistics well. <laughs> Craig, you sort of mentioned last week um, that this was one area they were going to have to look at taxing, and then here we have it in the budget. Feel prophetic? Um, no, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's. I don't want to use the word obvious, but yeah, it's obvious. Um, the government has to raise taxes, and uh, the easiest thing to tax is an immobile factor. Land is the most immobile of all factors of production, and so if you own land, you need to get used to this. Um, last year, I think the government raised somewhere around 72 million from land tax, and this year it's in the sort of 80s, mid 80s. Um, it needs to go north of 100 million. Um, I think in a sort of nicely balanced tax regime, land tax should account for something in the region of 130, 140 million dollars. So we've got a long, long way to go. Um, as Cordell pointed out, the largest percentage change uh, is going to be at the bottom. You know, people mm. formerly paying $88 and now paying $300. That's an increase of about a factor of 300, like a 300% mm. increase. But mind you, at the very top, where the, the, the band has gone from 47 to 50, I mean, in percentage terms, we're talking single digits. Mm. But in dollar terms, we're talking like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars 16000 In the future, I believe the increases will have to come from the middle because the middle, you know, we're spared. Um, the ticklish thing is that in the middle you've got a lot of, let's call them PLP supporters, mm -hmm. who may feel hard done by when their land tax increases by five or six thousand dollars a year. And that's going to be a difficult road for um, the finance minister to traverse, but it's one that quite frankly has to be dealt with. I always thought like the land tax here was really, really cheap. I mean, you pay, a lot of people pay less for their land tax than they do for relicensing their car. Mm -hmm. And I know my mom sold her house out in California um, two years ago and she had a 300, she sold the house for $300,000 and her land tax was $2,100 for the year. So compared to what I was paying, my house is nicer than her house. I was paying a lot less. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So there, there's room for increase, but um, humans being what they are, um, an increase in land tax is perceived as a loss in income, and we know that among humans, losses loom considerably larger than gains. 
-hmm. So it's going to be more pain for middle class Bermudians. Um, and, uh, you know, land is something that middle class Bermudians, uh, it occupies a significant part of their portfolio, of their wealth portfolio. And so, yeah, it's going to be more, more pain going forward, at least over the next three years. Which gets us to this year's budget. The, they had us, they're projecting a surplus of $8 million. Big deal, not a big deal, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, hiding the numbers sort of thing by not paying into the sinking fund. How would you describe that? It's hiding the numbers. Um, I, just on the land tax, I am concerned about the taking it out on the middle class. I feel like this budget in general is taking it out on the middle class. And, um, and somehow, just in general, we've got to figure out how, you know, I, the Americans, the Europeans are trying to tax the rich, but we've got to figure out how to access that income because right now it's the backs of middle class, lower class, poor Bermudians that are taking the brunt of supporting the government and our economy. Um, this, the surplus, I think, is just, it's window dressing. It's, it's, it's not a surplus. We're raiding the sinking fund. Uh, we're raiding the piggy bank, literally. Um, it's 84 per, we're taking 84% out of the sinking fund. Um, we're going to be left with like $34 million, I believe, um, after we've raided it. Plus, we're not paying into it. And OK, we're going to pay in this $8 million surplus, which is effectively a rounding figure in the end. Um, so I'm, I, I, it's, the government, it is something desperate. When you take out, when you raid your, your sinking fund to um, balance your budget, so to speak, and you're saying, oh, great, we've got it. We don't have a balanced budget. We've raided the sinking fund to pretend like we have a balanced budget and that we're, we're fiscally um, um, smart. Yeah, it's one of those things um, in the interest of efficiency. I often uh, wondered if humans were uh, creating a human, um, they probably wouldn't uh, create a human with two lungs or two kidneys. Because, you know, at, at least certain kinds of humans, especially those with financial training, um, they, they, they like or they don't like redundancy. So mm. what's the point in having two, two. lungs? What's the ha point in having two kidneys? Mm. And so raiding the sinking fund is sort of like that because they're saying, well, we're able to reduce mm. the interest on the debt. Which is a big, big point that they marked rather than taking out a, yeah. another loan. Mm. But we're talking about not a lot of money that's being saved. Um, as a human, I'd rather have uh, something in the kitty because there's an assumption that next year, things are going to be yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would rather assume that the next not. year things are not going to be fine. Yeah. So you don't raid your kitty when you don't have to. So this wasn't a rainy day. Or they have to explain to us why <laughs> it's a rainy day. Mm. Well, we and they haven't wasn't. done that. <laughs> we know it wasn't a rainy day. And, but maybe why it's a rainy day will come, I'm hoping that that will come out in the budget talks because I agree with you, it's not a rainy day. But if it really is, then they've got to do that explanation over the next couple of weeks um, while the budget yeah. is actually being debated. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, my, my take is that um, the sinking fund, of course, is set aside for repayment of loans, bonds, and those sorts of things. So um, that, that's its purpose. Um, I think I'm more concerned about the impact of the act rather than the act itself. Um, and so if I'm an investor, or if, as, as Craig just said, if uh, things are not so well next year and we have to go to the markets to borrow, although the minister said he will not be doing that, then the interest rates are likely to be higher as a result of that because we, we don't have that sort of um, comfort, if you will, of having money being put into the sinking fund. So everything really has to go well in order for this to work. And I'm kind of with Craig on this one, um, you know, I'm optimistic, but the way things are now, I would rather see that money being put in there. And certainly, if we paid out that 64, 65 million uh, into the sinking fund, uh, we would have a deficit of about 56 million. Um, and so the budget wouldn't be balanced. And he was saying that he can pay off or add to uh, the sinking fund with the surpluses if you get them. 
if you get if you get them. Yeah, and there seems to be you know some you know eight million dollars last year that they went over the budget. So I guess there's some question of whether or not we will have a surplus or how much it will be. Well, when you look at um, you know where government gets its revenue, um, forty cents in every dollar comes from uh, payroll tax, and twenty cents in every dollar comes. Uh, from customs duties. You've got your um, labor market kind of stagnant and uh, if there's less money circulating in the economy then the less likely you're having more imports coming in. Um, so I'm you know, a little bit concerned there and we keep relying on these two main areas for our revenue. Yeah, well, we have the same money circulating in the economy mm -hmm. that we're, that the government is trying to access yeah. and it's not increasing right. and it's interesting because um, when you read the budget it looks like oh well we've done so well since last year and the numbers are presented in very positive fashion and it just clicked for me that and I went back at about um, 2008 I went back and I looked at the figures for 2008 in terms of jobs and in 2008 we had 40,000 68 some odd jobs in the economy today we have like 33,800 jobs um, but we're running a government based on the 40,000 jobs mm. of 2008. Mm. And, um, and, you know, just putting on 100 jobs every year, mm. it's not enough. Mm. And even back then in 2008, we put on 200 and some odd jobs mm. per year. So somehow we've got to boost this economy, increase um, the, the jobs, and that's done by getting more industries in here. And mm -hmm. you can't just say, well, I'm going to go after this specific industry, because if it doesn't work out, then where are we? We have to try more mm -hmm. things at once. We mm -hmm. can't just say, oh, I'm going to do fintech, because the fintech, as we know, the fintech sector last year globally was, did not work out. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it had a bad year. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got to try many different things. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we're going to continue supporting this mm -hmm. government, and, this, and what we have, and as I said to Don previously, I don't want to pick on the civil service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a complicated and complex economy, and we need these numbers to support it. And the civil service, I think, is doing a good job. They're mm -hmm. general. I mean, sure, we can create mm -hmm. better efficiencies and and do better, always do better, and strive to be better. But they're yeah, good and yeah. smart people. Yeah, yeah. And if we're going to start cutting away at these people, then our government is, well, the, jobs that are, the job that the government does is not going to be as good as it was. So we've got to just figure out how, to, our, what the government should do is it should only be looking at how am I going to get more industries and different industries in here. And not just go after every insurance company because their, their model has changed. They're not bringing in hundreds of jobs like they used to. Um, so we have to look at other things. Yeah, um, with respect to taxation, there, there are two issues. One is the amount of tax that we need to collect. Mm -hmm. And the second, and I would say just as important, is the composition of those taxes. So for this particular budget, I stand to be corrected, but the proportion of revenue coming from payroll tax has never been larger. You know, it's gone well over four, not well, it's over 40%. <clears throat> now, as I remember, one of the recommendations coming out of the Tax Reform Commission was to decrease the dependency hmm. on a single um, source. Of revenue. So you, you would ideally like to get payroll tax down from north of 400 million, closer to 300 million. And uh, consumption taxes uh, increase those. So when I think about consumption taxes, I th there are a couple of components. One would be customs duties that we already collect, and uh, excise taxes, which arguably are half of all um, the half of the value of customs duties collected. And then the third piece is a service tax. So you have these things called consumption taxes, excise taxes, customs duties, and and, and a service tax, which at some point in time could be rolled into a a, a value added tax. But that this VAT could uh, also collect something north of $350 million. So now you've got far more balance in your economy. Um, at the moment, uh, goods are penalized heavily and services are not. Yeah. So whenever I go to get my nails done, um, essentially I'm not paying tax on my nails. I mean, um, of course, the, 
uh, the, the service provider has paid duty on the, the products, and the products, <laughs> but the service itself <laughs> is not taxed. Yeah, I, I had but somebody actually um, comment on Facebook last week who, who's in this sector, and they said, well, they feel like they're, they're going to be penalized twice because they're going to be penalized on the products and then penalized mm -hmm. on the service. Mm -hmm. And those are issues that have to be worked out, um, but we can't get around the fact that a, a, a good source of government revenue, and, and this has sort of helped the folks in the Bahamas immensely, and, in, and indeed in Jamaica, at balancing their budget and, in fact, uh, reaching the surpluses, that tapping into services, which arguably make up a larger portion of consumer spending than goods. So we're now spending more on eating out than we are spending when we go to the grocery store. Now, the, at the grocery store, that stuff's getting taxed, and we're spending less there. So it seems to me that we're missing out a great opportunity to tax the services that, are people, that people are, are, are consuming. So greater balance in terms of the taxes that we, that we levy will, I think, be less harmful than the direction in which this government has gone in terms of jacking up payroll taxes. It's just not what I would call a good vision for, for our economy, given that we're trying to pay down $2.5 billion in debt. And we still haven't started that. But somehow we still have to figure out how to access the to tax the wealthy. We're not taxing the wealthy. And mm -hmm. that's, and you know, even when you talk about service tax or going into a, va a VAT, mm -hmm. um, it, the effect is going to hit the middle class, the lower class, the poor, working class. And, um, and the way our whole economy is structured, it's structured on not taxing the wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I I, we, we, I know Paula Cox tried back um, almost 10 years ago to tax, to, to broaden the bands and to tax the, the higher uh, band. And yes, it, and got it pushed back. got pushed back, but it also got pushed back because she announces it in February and it's applied April 1st. Mm. Now, if you start talking, if you announce it now to be applied in a year, then um, companies and people can plan for that, they can budget. but. Um, you know, we've, there's millions and there's a lot of money that is, that is just not being accessed. Mm -hmm. And instead, we keep going after um, the local Bermudians. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not fair. It's not fair to us. Mm -hmm. Well, one problem with going um, after wealthy, the wealthy uh, intelligently put their wealth in mobile factors. Mm -hmm. So if they're not rich because they're dumb. Mm -hmm. They're rich because they're smart and they know how to avoid taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, to the, to the government's credit, they did raise the top band, band seven, to 50%, from 47 to, to 50%. Now, I'm beginning to wonder how much further can, mm -hmm. can you increase that particular band, band seven and band six? Um, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could have a discussion about that. Um, I think that and that's I band think seven and six of the ARV. ARV. The ARVs, yeah. Um, so they're talking over ninety thousand. No, but you can also um, increase. I think over time, you don't do it this year, but you you have to have some sort of forward-looking mm -hmm. um, budget budgeting process. And you know, maybe it's. I'm not talking about you tax ten percent or twenty fifty percent of anybody making over a million dollars. I mean, it could be a, a small amount. It could be the, you add on 2%. You're talking about payroll now. Payroll tax mm -hmm. is yeah. what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Because right now, we're not accessing, mm -hmm. the government is not accessing that money. Mm -hmm. And that's both local and expats that are making that those amounts. So you're talking about the, the ceiling, mm -hmm. which is now, where is it, 850, uh, 950? Mm -hmm. I can't remember oh, what the I ceiling thought is. 750 I thought it was 750. Yeah, 750. 750. 750. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, any income, Over any 750. wage income, that's earned in excess of 750 is it's tax free. Not, yeah. Going after that, I agree. I mean, um, I'm in favor of that. Um, you don't put it into effect today mm. or at April 1. Mm. You you have to announce these sort of things mm. so that companies and peep individuals can, as I said, budget for it, mm. plan for it. And it doesn't have to be a massive percentage. Mm. It can mm. be a small enough percentage, but yet we will yeah. be able to, to get something from it. I just want to go back to something that you said, Cheryl, because you're the first person who's, who's articulated 
the way you did in terms of we need more industry here. Folk have been saying we need more people here. And I've always responded, well, if you brought in, if you gave the people who are asking for more people to be here, because that is a factor of uh, uh, a function of increasing the, the GDP, the other one, of course, is productivity. If you just simply bring more people here, the question would be, if I give you 1,000 free work permits and bring in people for two or three years, where would they go? But if you bring in industry, you're creating jobs. And so, yeah, I would like to hear more on how we're going to create industry as opposed to just bring folk here because I don't think that's the solution at all and I think the minister the finance minister said that you know just to focus on people we need um, industries that create jobs well and the idea you, is that when you have the industry you bring in the people you bring in the people and, and you have, then your and you tax have jobs here. goes yeah. up I, and you get more money in and your I economy totally and agree with that. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just it's basic and mm -hmm. and I'm at I, I, you know, I am doom and gloom. Sorry, I, I, I heard they called you that in the um, newspaper or something really? last no, week. Really? No, it was on Facebook, so they called you Mr. Doom, doom and Gloom. gloom. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> I'm <laughs> joining you because this is a doom and gloomy budget if you really read in, in mm -hmm. read it mm -hmm. and understand it. And um, I'm, they've got to start throwing things against the wall. Like, mm -hmm. try it. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. this one won't work out, but this one will. And we've got to go after bringing in um, diversifying our economy and we can't just pay lip service to it by putting it in a paragraph at the beginning of a budget we've actually got to put people in place and start executing on it well I think I think part of the thing is there's like three paragraphs here on the in the budget on, on diversifying the economy um, but there's not any real substance as to as to how, how they're going to do it yeah because yeah, it talks about fintech reg tech mm -hmm. insurance tech uh, biotech arbitration aviation shipping life sciences Blue economy, intellectual property, satellites in space, nearshoring, but there's no real. Well, to be fair, governments. I mean, it's like I don't know on a university campus where you're you're, you're you got a brand new campus and you're trying to figure out where to put sidewalks. Should the administrators put down the sidewalks and make the students walk along the sidewalks, or should the university maybe wait and let the students walk and then you put the sidewalks where down they where they walked. <laughs> Well, the other problem is some, some industries require um, legislation and regulatory structure. Mm -hmm. And so you can talk all you like about, I'm going to bring in this industry or that industry, but until you actually put in place the infrastructure that can support that industry, nobody's going to come in and invest in your island or your country or your city or so wherever. So what kind of infrastructure are you thinking about? Um, some in it depends on what industry you're talking about. Mm. That um, and that that's why the government. That's why you ask a government to come up with a national plan. That's why you ask for them to um, decide what industries can would be good to have in here. What could we be doing? What are other small countries like we're doing? Where is Bermuda Place? What should we be looking at? Mm. There's there are lots of um, lots of things that we could be looking at, and we're we're still. Um, captivated solely by mm. uh, insurance and international mm. business and those sort of byproducts mm. of those mm. industries. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the suggestions that I've heard um, w is, is a, basically a shipping port, a place, because of course Bermuda, to, to quote Michael Jarvis's book, mm. is in the eye of all trade. Mm. We are. Mm. We are strategically placed. <clears throat> so one suggestion is that you have a place where these mega ships can come and uh, strip down their cargoes and put them on smaller ships and then those smaller ships will go off to the idea is to have like a duty free create a duty free port yes because where we're located with the panama canal having opened up and also the northwest passage with global warming mm -hmm. is opening up um bermuda is perfectly placed in the atlantic to have a duty free mm -hmm. port and you could um you could have a whole light repackaging plants mm -hmm. so that you're we even doing some light ma manufacturing um, this would create thousands of jobs and bring in the thousands of people that they everybody is talking about bringing in but until mm -hmm. you do mm -hmm. something or see if it could even work um, you, you have to you have to Let's try can we do the same we have to do the legislation that will we'll create benefit we'll I just want to get that. this point can we do the same with the airport since we already have it built is going to be much larger can we come sort of not a hub but sort of 
have more frequent airlines because other than the 13 or 14 flights that we have during the day in the summer and about seven or eight uh, that during requires, the winter. If you have to have the traffic and so right. if you so, but if, industry, if be, you'll have the traffic. If we have a but hub, but I'm saying a, if we have, if if you have, have a, a mini hub, if I use that term. Or if you have a duty-free port, mm. that includes both the sea yeah. part so, yeah. and so the it, air So it's, there's a possibility there. Yeah, um, although I could see <clears throat> trying to get in these mega ships, uh, something probably would have to happen to the channel and dredging mm. and then you get environmental <laughs> impacts and then mm. things will be delayed because you have to get all the reports done. Oh, no doubt. There are going to be challenges. There's, there's a reason why it hasn't been done. There are, there are barriers to it, and thus the, the, the necessity of having legislation, uh, having open discussion about, so what are, the, what are the downsides, what are the environmental issues associated with building some mega port uh, in Bermuda. But this is just one of, 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 of several ideas that should be in the public domain, something that's, that's sort of discussed by, by our public instead of all we've heard so far is uh, the financial services, you know, fintech, this high tech stuff that most of us don't, don't really understand. I think it's a lot easier for people to get their brains wrapped around the concept of a mega port in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's somewhat Bermudian because, you know, in our, in our maritime history, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Our goal was to reduce transactions cost. We built uh, Bermuda sloops, we built brigantines, we built schooners. And they essentially moved, Bermudians were commissioned, slaves included, mm -hmm. to move goods from colonial America into the Caribbean, the Dutch West Indies, <coughs> pissing off the British in, in, along the way. But that's, that, that's the kind of people we are. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of a mega port is in some ways reclaiming mm -hmm. a part of our heritage. Of what we did. Yeah. Um, no, there's, there's, all, there's a lot of things that we have to look at. I mean, again, they've paid lip service to reducing the cost of living for, um, mm -hmm. for Bermuda. Yeah, there's nothing about the but living how wage. Are you do it? <laughs> if you, if, and that, I say that goes towards becoming a more sustainable Bermuda. Mm -hmm. But you've got to think, I mean, how are you going to reduce cost? Right now we import most of our food, yeah. mm -hmm. every, everything really. Um, and indeed, fruits and vegetables that are grown in Bermuda are more expensive than what we import. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to figure out well how what am I talking about how am I really going to reduce um, the cost of living of, of food for, well, for Bermudians? You've talked about hydroponics before. Your big or aqua aquaponics because aqua aqua hydroponics <laughs> is very <laughs> interesting. It's that's the idea of you have your fish farm and then you grow um, your vegetables, mm. fruits mm. and vegetables, mm -hmm. and it's the re the waste from waste the from fish, fish that um, mm. fertilizes mm -hmm. the um, the mm. vegetables. Mm. It hasn't been proven efficient yet. Although Singapore seems but, to be doing it. Yeah, they're it doing it, but at a pretty it, large it's been scale. done, they've been doing it also in China, but without the support and financial support of the government, the government. it hasn't, mm -hmm. and also Singapore, there's a lot of financial support from the government as well. Yes. I mean, technology will improve so that it will become mm -hmm. um, efficient and it will be profitable. Uh, and it's, I mean, there's no reason why we can't start looking at it so that in 10 years or five years when the, when the technology has improved, it's something we can immediately put into mm. place. There's a model but, at the college now yeah. with that. <laughs> but, yeah. um, aqu yeah. you know, aquaculture um, has been, I, there's no reason we can't do aquaculture. Uh, we're, all we have is water. Mm -hmm. And aquaculture has been proven to be a poverty, poverty alleviator mm -hmm. in numerous countries around the world. Mm -hmm. It has worked everywhere, and there's no reason why it can't work in Bermuda. The technology that we have today versus what was 30 years ago or something, I think when it was mm -hmm. first tried, mm -hmm. um, it's light years ahead. Um, and it's, it's a limited amount of investment. It's not very expensive to do. Mm -hmm. And again, you food. Mm -hmm. And it's not only just food for locally, but it's, you, we can export it and bring in foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to come back to um, the port. T t the port. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the port too. <laughs> One of the, uh, poor, P-O-O-R. Oh, the poor, okay. Poor. Oh, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. One of the things that I was surprised, a surprised omission from the budget was tax relief for people earning under $48,000. I, I thought that the payroll tax payable by the employee could have been set at zero so that the, yeah. the, the, those employees mm -hmm. are paying no payroll tax. Yeah. That would go some way toward 
uh, alleviating the pain and suffering of those people at the bottom. But of course, mm -hmm. if you're going to do that, as Cheryl suggested, you're going to have to increase marginal rates at the top end mm -hmm. by either actually increasing the rate or raising the ceiling mm -hmm. from 750000 to maybe $1.5 million. Um, that, I don't really understand why or you have that was bands. missing. You can have the, mm -hmm. you have our first band and then you have your second band to 750 and mm -hmm. then you have everybody over 750 and you just, I don't, the numbers have to mm -hmm. be crunched, crunched but yeah. 2%. Well, you know, um, talking about the payroll tax, and there has been some relief for the retail sector. Again, I always question, the relief is going to the employer. In other countries, the employer pays the payroll tax. But the relief for this sector is going to the employees who don't have a payroll, who don't, shouldn't be paying a payroll tax, the legislation allows for the recovery of, I think, 5% or whatever it is, of the payroll tax from the employee. So the, actually, the employee is subsidizing the payroll tax of the employer. So now we're giving a concession to the employer. The employee still has to pay it. Why don't you reverse that? Give the, like Craig just said, give the concession to the employee. And that person is likely going to spend that money in the economy. Because if I give it to the employer, it's probably just going to affect their bottom line. Right. And let, me, let me jump in right here, too, because I've I got a question from a, a viewer. And he says, why are concessions uh, given to the retail and hospitality sector year after year and not other sectors? Uh, they get duty relief on capital items to improve their facilities, but salons, mechanics, and other small businesses get nothing. The sum of these uh, companies left out of, is a big part of the small, medium business sized business in Bermuda. Uh, and to make improvements, they need to set higher margins. Most have some retail components, but are not included. Well, I have a different way of attacking the problem uh, on the employer side. Um, if we could restructure the employer portion of the payroll tax to look more like the employee side of the payroll tax, by that I mean on the employee side, there are marginal tax rates. So for the first, say, 48,000, you're paying uh, 3%. Mm -hmm. The next 48,000, you might be paying 7%. And the next 48,000, you might be paying 10%. So if you're, once you get that 49,000th dollar, you're, not, you're, you're only paying the increase in tax on $1,000, not all, on all 49. Right. A lot of people misunderstand that. They just think, oh, yeah. I don't want to earn that extra $2 so yes. I'll get whacked. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're an employer, and you decide to take on an, an additional employee, and you, that employee puts you into another tax ban, a higher tax ban, you're now paying tax at a higher rate on all of your payroll, mm -hmm. so that by taking on an additional employee mm -hmm. that may cost you uh, $60,000, your payroll tax could go up by $60,000, because the average on the entire payroll is going up, mm -hmm. as opposed to just being on that particular employee's mm -hmm. income. For the life of me, I don't understand why we have this antiquated way of taxing employers. Because if the, the, the finance minister, last year's finance minister uh, and premier, suggested that payroll tax was a job killer, well, you could very easily make it a non-job killer mm -hmm. by introduce by restructuring mm -hmm. it in terms of marginal bans. But that hasn't been done. Um, Simple change, you don't even have to uh, try and increase the, 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 the amount that you take in. It's simply about you know, rearranging it, but it hasn't happened. And uh, if, if someone can tell me like, why that's not happening, why that isn't good for jobs, or why that will not sort of help uh, Bermudians or employers grow jobs, and how that could assist people in the retail. So it's not a targeted tax cut. If you have a small payroll, you will pay a smaller marginal rate. And as you grow, your payroll tax as an employer will not escalate exponentially. Um, and, e and everybody would benefit from that. People in the retail, people in reinsurance, um, uh, tradespeople. Yeah, the mechanic, yeah. the carpenter. Yeah. Well, I, I think to that point and to the writer's point, um, and I'm just hesitating uh, a guess, that it might have to do with foreign exchange. Um, the hotel sector brings in foreign exchange. The mechanic less likely 
to do so. The other places less likely to do so. So um, I'm not I'm not sure the rationale, mm -hmm. but uh, it may have something to do with that. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things um, that was mentioned in the budget, there was an increase in employment by 0.4 percent, mm. but a decrease in employment income by 0.6 percent. What do you think this this signifies? Well, you know the data. Um, at least the most, the more recent data mm. has errors, and mm -hmm. the statistics department is very clear about this. They say, "Look, here are the numbers. Um, um, these numbers, when revised, will take into consideration um, payroll or income that we didn't receive on time." So that the, the the increase is so small that I'm not sure that there's anything there yet. I'd rather take a look at it in the year's Although, time. Although, you know, generally there's um, a trend towards the wealthier getting wealthier. Oh, and yeah, no doubt. The middle class is being squeezed out. Um, and so you, and we've all seen the data of the wealthiest people have um, the large share of the income in the world. And there's no, and Bermuda is. I see that statistic as indicating yeah. exactly yeah. Okay. that's I just what's going on. Interrupt you, Cordell has to leave. He has another appointment. But I, I thank you for joining us today, and we'll have you back um, in a f on a future show. Thank, thank you, you, Cordell. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, although I did see, like in the, in the U.S., the the jobs are increasing, but the amount of pay. The is middle actually, income jobs are not. Yeah, the, not the, you not know, happening. the middle, the professional managerial class is not. Um, they're being squeezed out and as opposed to um, lower paying jobs are being put on. And the gig economy is expanding. Uh, employers are trying to find all sorts of ways of avoiding the overhead of carrying additional employees. And so they're subcontracting out. Um, I don't know whether this is a, a sort of the nature of this so-called new economy where uh, you know business people don't want to take on that, that, that overhead, especially if you're a, a new business, a growing business. Um, established businesses may have a different view of it, but you know the bricks and mortar approach to building a business seems to be something of the past. Right. I mean, we're seeing it in, in international business. The number of new jobs is, is rather small. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, is, is this the, 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 the new reality? reality? Right, yeah. well, again, you know, we're here at the House Bermuda, you know, a cooperative learning space, and, and we've seen more and more of these types of businesses pop up in Bermuda, in Hamilton, to, because there's so many people that are part of the gig economy, and, and they don't want to work from home, they'd rather have somewhere else where they have a little bit of facility, but not paying all the, the overhead. The overhead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's going to take a while, a, a, a lot more data. I think before we can be uh, definitive or make, make sort of conclusions about where this economy is going. Um, but as Cheryl alluded to, I mean, inequality has been rising uh, since about 1980. Mm -hmm. um, there's and no one doubt about that. And also the rise of populism and nationalistic yes. tendencies, mm -hmm. xenophobia, yeah. the all big, of that. And it's not, you know, we, we have that discussion a, a little bit here in Bermuda, mm -hmm. but it's everywhere in the world. Yeah. And um, but the challenge for me is 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 that uh, mobility, social mobility, is down. Yeah. So people at at the bottom have a lower probability of moving from the bottom to the middle or to the top today than they did uh, thirty or forty years ago. So your you're decreasing the probability or people's uh, expectations of social mobility. So essentially, mm -hmm. the message seems to be, well, if you're born poor, you're going to stay poor. Whereas, say, 30 or 40 years ago, I think there was the idea that I can grow up and be a CEO. But there's increasing evidence that um, from people like Raj Chetty, who's done some really, really interesting work on social mobility in the U.S., and it, it, it's frightening, you know, it's, it's almost as if we're seeing the, the evolution of a new aristocracy. Mm -hmm. So that at the Harvard, the Yale, the Princeton, the, the, the top tier institutions, it's basically become a dynasty. Um, if you're lucky enough to get into that institution, yes, you will, you, you could be propelled from the very bottom to the top. But because of the dynastic nature of those institutions, it's difficult to get into them. 
So we're, we're seeing more social mobility, more fluidity among community colleges, among lower ranked institutions. So people going to a you know, mom and pop uh, kind of university, getting a, a good degree, getting the skills that they need, those are, seem to be the, the, the more probabilistic ways of, of, of working class people moving into the middle class. Yeah. But do you think like the government's trying to, to promote that, we, you know, because they've got uh, the, in the, in the budget they talk about anyone from a public school with a 3.0 GPA can go to the Bermuda College for That's free. That's a start, but we, we need I think to it be, should be every. I think it should be to, everybody. Yeah. I yeah. think that the, the government, you know, it shouldn't just, one of the things that's so great about community colleges is that they give a chance to the late bloomer. So you didn't do so well in high school. Many people pull it together in college and, and the community college is that opportunity. Um, the Bermuda College is an excellent institution. I, I have, a, it has a little space in my heart. I just, I love the place. Um, and, you know, Dorinda has done, Dorinda Green has done mm -hmm. a phenomenal job with um, the Bermuda College, but I really, it's not that much money. With that grant, we should be giving that money to every Bermudian student, um, whether they're from private school or public school. Um, some of those private school kids were at private school based on grants and financial aid. Mm. So just because you go to private school doesn't necessarily mean you're of the, the, the rich and wealthy and Although well healed. Although more, more people go to private school probably. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, you can't, I think that, the, the whole, that they, it's a small enough amount of money that can, um, to give each Bermudian um, a who chance. Who chooses to make that decision. Who chooses to make that decision to go to the Bermuda College. That, that start in life, that free start in life, and it's a and it's a and that's a true investment in Bermuda's future. That's looking ahead. That's not just doing a budget year to year. That's 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 investing in our future. But it is a start, um, and uh, but I, I wish they had gone farther there. Well, I know, like I grew up in California, Bermudian, but grew up in California, and at the time uh, I went to community college after high school, and it was free at that point in time. Anybody wanted to go to community college could go to community college, and you just pay for your books. Mm. So, yeah, social mobility. I mean, if the the moment the belief in social mobility goes, I think your society uh, it, it's over. You know, people need aspirations, they need dreams, and they need to see evidence that that dream is real. Um, you can't sort of show me a Beyonce and a Jay Z and say, "See, if you work hard, you can make it as well." That's that, that's more of a fantasy. I'm, I'm talking about putting in front of people realistic expectations that yes, you know, if if if, if you go to go to college, you, your life will be uh, measurably improved. All we have to do is look at the unemployment rates in the census or or in the labor force survey. Unemployment rates among college educated people are significantly lower than unemployment rates among those people who just finished high school. So, education, you know. It, it's really the passport to the future. I think Malcolm X was the one that, 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 that said it so, so eloquently. So if, if, if the government is going to be spending money, it needs to be pumped into that particular um, avenue. Yeah. Keep the Bermudian dream alive. Yeah, cause uh, like, for sure, because the American dream is largely dead. dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more alive. If, if you want the American drive, uh, a dream and you live in the United States, you, you're better advised to go to Canada because I think it's, it's more alive there than it is in, in the U.S. Now, one of the things that the uh, government talked about was offering a mortgage uh, guarantee on homes. Craig's already laughing. Uh, creating a <laughs> and creating a government-backed mortgage lender for public sector employees. Uh, the math on that works out, they said $5,300 for a year or just under $250 a month. Uh, what's your reaction? I'm trying to figure out where this is coming from. I want to, yeah. That was my, I mean, we, the numbers, they're not there. If, um, if you had to raise your um, sinking fund <laughs> to balance your budget, and now you're going to um, create a government guarantee, um, and these institutions, well, it's the proven as failures in the United States. I understand they're working in Canada, but Canada is a much more socialist government with a more ability to, and a, more of a will to, um, to, to um, support that kind of a structure, I, 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 that's not where the money should be going. Okay, well, let me, let, let me, I'm gonna be devil's advocate and say, well, maybe this is a way of helping the middle class. What do you think? 
You're not going to buy that? No, because I think <laughs> that it's hurting. I think that in the end, if the government, if our government um, goes bankrupt, oh. the whole country is going to fall apart. And this is, yeah. not, this is not necessarily where we need it. I'd rather yeah. see that, uh, that extra money go into the education, education. Of, our, mm. of our future than, um, than a half-baked guarantee when we don't even have the backing, any solid backing to, to support that guarantee. My mm. God, we just raided the, our, we had $214 million in the, in the kitty and- Yeah, and we have no idea- And we took 180 out? How much out? this is gonna cost. This is the, right. No, this is, this is, this yeah. is- We well, already got $500 million worth of guarantees on the books. Right. And so, is this, a, is this 100 million? Is it 50 million? Is it, is it an additional 500 million? Well, the latest quarterly banking digest from the BMA shows that the non-performing loan rate at the moment is 5.9%. Which is 190. Well. You said it was 190 million dollars? I don't think it's 190. I think oh. it's, it's about uh, somewhere in the 20 or 30 million dollar range. That just okay. wipes out the rest of our kitty. We only have 34 million dollars oh. left after we take the 180. Oh. Basic math. And that, that ratio historically, I think, is around two or three percent. It's been elevated ever since the, the financial crisis. Yeah, it yeah. reached its peak at about 12 percent, I think, 2000. If I was a bank, as soon as the 30 days is up, I'd go to the government and say, okay, give me all the money, give me, you know, give me the 30 million or whatever, and then I have no, then we have no money left. I think the reasoning, though, is they felt, feel like that if people were paying less, that they had that $250 they should be spending in the grocery store or mm -hmm. restaurants or some other service and, and keeping it in the economy moving in that way rather than giving it to the bank. Or more likely paying down debt, which is not really going to uh, add anything to the economy. Right. Well, I, I told Cheryl when we were having a conversation, I said, like, if I had 250 more, if the interest rate was lower, then I would probably get a bigger house with, because uh, I could afford more, and then, and then I'm not spending the and, money. And anymore. that's not the signal I think we want, we want to send to people to buy bigger houses. No, mm. I, I, I don't know. Actually, looking at that, I, I don't know that it with Bermuda's cost of living, and you, we see things. I mean, insurance premiums are going up. Um, that two hundred fifty dollars is just going to go. You know, it, it, it's going to be eaten up already. So I'm not. I, I'm not sure that it makes. It's going to make that much of a difference. Well, they, they talked about doing something with health care reform and health insurance, lowering the insurance costs. They're adding a tax to insurance premiums. There's a financial service mm -hmm. course. And yes, it's supposed to be on the companies, but do you think it's the companies that are going to mm -hmm. absorb that cost? It's going to be passed on to the client. It's supply and demand that determines how the tax is shared, not governments. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we mistake that, that fact that, um, you know, just because the government forces the, the employer or, or, or the provider to provide a tax, it doesn't mean that the, that person can't pass the tax on in one way or, or, or another. another. They do. They do. But of course, we delude ourselves in thinking, oh, well, it's, it's on the uh, insurance. It's, it's not. It's not. That's why we have to really look at how we can access that, the wealth, the income of the wealthy, whether it's, um, and at this point, it has to be through salary tax because um, the tax assurance was um, extended to two thirty-five to twenty thirty-five. Remember the tax uh, um, on profits, on, um, profits yeah. of companies for exempt companies was extended until twenty thirty-five. So mm -hmm. we can't um, access corporate income or, or dividends or. Um, well, you can access dividends of of local companies. Of local companies, but yeah. again, it, we're. We're supporting the. It's only being supported on the backs of our of truly locals and the middle class Bermudians, and we've got to look at how can we access the income of the wealthy. And I think it's going to have to be looking at that tax band above seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, um, I there's, agree. There's no. We can't just keep going back next year and increasing the ARV tax and increasing and um, the rental tax, the rental tax and the services and mm. that's you know who's getting their hair done? It's it's it's. Um, well, the services tax, I think, is. I think it's fair that that whether I'm buying a good or a service, I should be subject to tax. Why should service providers be be, be exempt? 
the, that part I can it's accept. It's going to make things even more expensive than they already are, and yeah. they're trying to bring down the cost of living. Oh, agreed. And so I, I say, let's. We, I understand what you're saying about having a more balanced economy, and maybe mm -hmm. that works if we bring down other taxes and we increase payroll tax can, afford, can 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 in fact come down. I think it should, unless except for that upper band that I'm trying to tax. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and until we. And we have to stop. We're going to have to completely rehaul our our tax system. Um, and we can. We don't have. We can. We can tax corporate income tax. We don't have to tax it at the levels that it's taxed in the U.S. or Canada. And we can be competitive and still um, attract business. But our we've got the way we perceive ourselves. The way we 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 move in the world we it's it's not effective right now mm. and if we start bringing in other industries again we're going to have to look at taxing and how we tax and what our tax structure is and when we do that then we will be more efficient and we'll and we can be more sustainable and we can and we can move on and and the government will even grow and we'll have a bigger civil service because we'll, because to service a bigger economy you're going to need more people that's just fact well for me I, I would like to spend the next 10 years focused on uh, reducing the 2.5 billion like what's the most effective the most efficient way of getting that number down because um, debt service costs last year up. we're knocking on uh, 200 million you know, there's a, what, like 111, 115 in interest, and then there's a sinking fund contribution, which for, which for all intents and purposes is a, is a part of your, your debt service. So, you know, we've got to figure out a way to get debt service costs down, because in terms of a ministry, I mean, this particular year, uh, the health ministry is over, what, 240 million? Yeah, 21 percent of the budget. Yes. But debt service is right behind it. I mean, and and until we can get a handle on the debt, I think um, we're going to be in, in, in a straitjacket. Yeah, um, although, I mean, I guess the government would argue we're, we're taking $180 million off the book this year and not incurring any more. $180 that's million? That's assuming that... Well, that's that, assuming the two bond notes that come due. And then... Uh, well, the, the amount outstanding... how are we going to make our budget next year? Yeah, the, the amount outstanding is still $2.5 billion. And so how are you going to make your budget next year? How are you going to service that debt next year? Yeah. This is a budget for this year and this year only. There's no foresight. There's no, and, and that's what's so scary about this budget. Well, we have targets. We have two targets. There's the ratio of debt service to tax, which is presently around sort of 17%. And the government has set a target of 10%, which means you need to bring down the debt service cost or raise taxes. Uh, uh, I don't think we want to raise taxes too far, but the, the, the number one focus has to be bringing down those debt service payments. And the, the more important target is debt, the $2.5 billion, as a ratio of the total tax take. If that number, if we can get that toward 80%, which is the target that the government has, has accepted, uh, I think a lot of our problems are going to go away. Right now, I mean, that ratio of debt to tax is around 230 mm percent. -hmm. So we've got a long way to go from 230 percent down to 80. And the great news is, once we get to 80, it's a stone's throw to zero. So once that, once that debt is, is sort of heading towards zero, a lot of the problems that we presently see will go away. Well, there's a lot more freedom to do what you yeah. want to do. We don't have much wriggle room at the moment. And, and I think that's, that's the source of, of, of the tension, of the aggravation. It's like, oh, God, you know, my land tax, I can't afford to see those things going up any further. Um, why, not, why don't you tax someone else? But that's because there's limited wriggle room. And so this sort of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, which is essentially what I'm rating the, the sinking fund is about, it, you know, no one's impressed by it. They, they, can, they can see through it until we begin to attack the, the big issues, which is the debt, um, well, th this problem it won't go in anywhere, and we need a time frame. But you need you need money. You need to boost your tax base. You, do. you need you need. It goes back to um, diversifying the economy, not just diversifying the economy, but increasing the growing industry, it. growing it, bringing mm. in industries, other industries. 
Um, and until that happens, and I don't see that, it can't happen, in, it doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen in 365 days. Mm -hmm. And that is why I look at what's going to happen next February when the next budget is mm -hmm. announced, what are they going to say, and, how, and what's going to happen. Well, it's sort of like we've been talking about casino you know, gaming as sort of, it's not a pensia for everything that's going to happen, but we've been talking about it for four or five years and now. And there are still challenges. And, you know, I thought it was about 10 years. Well, <laughs> since the commission, at least since the commission's <laughs> been in place, uh -huh. the, to, to try to, you know, okay, if something's really happening, we've got a group supposed to be getting it off the ground, and we're stuck because there's no bank willing to take that money. Well, they could, you know, in other countries, uh, the post office, for example, in France, acts as a depository. Mm. Um, it, we could, I think maybe they should look at... Um, other options, um, you know, changing, looking at the post office legislation, looking to see if that's possible, looking at other, what other countries do with the post office. I guess the post office in France is a depository, it writes, um, it issues money orders, checks. Yeah. Um, well, the post office in Bermuda used to be a profit center. Mm -hmm. In the 60s, it, it, it contributed to the consolidated fund. But unfortunately, um, disruption, uh, innovation is something that's been lacking in that particular de department. An economy needs disruption, and we seem to be short on the disruptive influence in our economy. Well, I know they've been trying to create other things, you know, making a, uh, something to compete with FedEx, and but it really hasn't impacted, seems like, too much at this point. Well, this is where I think the institutions uh, come into play. Um, you, don't, you don't put the institutions down first. You figure out where people want to go, mm -hmm. and then you put the sidewalks down to allow to make their, their their, their path well, no, easier. You also have to have a vision. You have to see where where does where do we want to be in 20 years? Where do we want to be in 50 years? And I don't see that vision. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. I didn't see it with the OBA. I don't see it with the PLB. In your opinion, what does it look like? What would I like to see? Yeah. I would like to see a fully sustainable Bermuda. Um, one of the things that was is missing in this budget, um, eliminating, looking at, Setting a date, a target date for eliminating our dependence on uh, fossil fuels. Is it going to be, could it be 2030, 30, 35, so energy 40, security. energy security, hmm. health security? Um, you see, we're very slow to, to set down targets. I mean, we couldn't even set targets for, for, for our fiscal policy, our debt policy. So, I mean... Mm. But things like creating a fully, a full, fully green economy hmm. um, would also create jobs. Yes. And um, and you want job creation without even thinking? It's another. It's a whole other industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I so I want a, I I want a vision. I'm desperately in need of a vision. For is the, that for more Bermuda. likely? Thinking about your uh, um, energy security, is that more likely, or is it prerequisite on a new energy company coming to Bermuda? I, well, first of all, no, because it, um, we're small. I mean, mm -hmm. to some extent, we Belco is handling the fossil fuel yes. um, <laughs> economy for Bermuda, and it doesn't need. If and you had another competition, I don't. And not you know. making the transition to and the green not, economy. And they're not making the transition. And they're blocking the transition. And to they're the green blocking economy. it. But we, as but the That's government, the can have that vision. Mm -hmm. It's the government that has to have that vision. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily people coming in and putting down roads. I've heard that too much. Hmm. in Bermuda that, oh, it's the private sector that has to, that um, is the impetus for doing everything. No, it's also the government that has to have a vision. Mm -hmm. It has to say, I, yes, I'm not going to be here in, in, in 20 years or 50 years, but I, this is what I see and this is what I perceive and I'm going to set this target. And you know what? If you do that, the next mm -hmm. government that comes in in five years because you've already set that mm -hmm. path is going to have to follow it. It may change it a little, but mm -hmm. it's not going to change, oh no, we don't want a green economy. Oh no, we don't want to be mm -hmm. sustainable. That's what we need to do. Yeah, okay. But part of the thing is like the company that wants to buy, send it the parent company of Belco, they, you know, they want to be able to um, make it more green by the fact they want to be able to allow people to buy solar panels at a cheaper rate by bringing them in bulk on their end and then um, get their money up by, by putting it on the Belco bill for or whatever it's going to be called down, down the road and collecting their money back, but then transitioning people to, to using more solar power. Well, actually, I mean, you can... I'd rather ask the question, 
uh, with respect to this company, mm. um, are they really interested in greening the economy or are they interested in making money? Well, making money, money obviously. Making, exactly. It's always the bottom so, line. But the other thing but is, a make, what we're making not, money is greening. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I admit, maybe, that um, you know, wave technology, water, um, it's not as efficient as it will be in 50 years. And we're not mm -hmm. understanding that technology um, expands um, and improves exponentially mm -hmm. in time. And it, if you set your target and you set your goals, then we could maybe even in 50 years be selling electricity mm -hmm. um, to other places because the ability to transfer will will potentially will be there. Now I'm not a scientist, I'm not a I'm not an electrical engineer mm -hmm. and they may all be laughing at me on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's we have to start thinking about mm -hmm. this and we have to start we have to start somewhere. And starting somewhere can be as easy as setting a date. I want to be mm -hmm. um, independent of fossil fuels by twenty twenty by twenty forty. And then the benefits, I mean when you think about you know the greening your economy mm -hmm. um, I'd rather think of it in terms of hard numbers. Mm -hmm. Greening your economy, becoming self-sufficient with, with respect to energy, essentially gives your economy like a shock absorber mm -hmm. so that when things go crazy in the oil sector, a, a war somewhere, a social conflict, and prices start to rise, you essentially have a buffer because you're relying on something that isn't connected to the war in that particular uh, exactly. part of the world. Uh, you're also saving yourselves uh, foreign currency. Bermuda is, is in this sort of, we're like on a hamster wheel. We're, we're pursuing these foreign currencies so that we can buy the fossil fuel that to keep the lights have. on. If you have a so-called green economy, green sounds nice, if you have this green economy, you're decreasing your dependence on foreign currency. And, and, so, and world uh, politics. Yes. And so you're freeing yourself up again. And so that goes also to the whole insurance industry and international business. We are too dependent on the whims and needs of foreign countries. If the EU, the United States, decides they want to get rid of um, uh, international financial centers tomorrow, yeah. what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. They just do it. And then we're done. Um, and we don't have any other industries in here. We have no other means of feeding our people, of, of giving health care to our people. That's why I say we need, that's what I see. I see a Bermuda that... It's, it, it's, you know, but the precedent, of course, has been set during those days of our booming maritime economy. All of our eggs were in the basket of that maritime economy. Mm -hmm. Building the sloops, the brigs, the schooners uh, to go across the Atlantic to move goods and services. And then there was a thing called the Industrial Revolution. There was steam and the demand for our services or, or geopolitics. I mean, heaven forbid, at that time, the U.S. got its independence from, from um, Britain. And now it became difficult for our sailors, our seamen, to access those ports. So a combination of technological innovation, uh, a combination of, of, of political change, revolution in the United States, wars with France, um, threw Bermuda into a, a depression around the time of emancipation. Um, again, it, it's a case of putting all of our egg, eggs in the basket, being you know, totally dependent on the, on, the, on the outside world. And perhaps we're destined to make that mistake again by being totally dependent on the outside world, not putting into place the shock absorbers to take care of things like um, energy. Energy. Energy, energy um, security is critical. Yeah. And um, it could go poof in, a, in overnight, and but that's it what's very me scary. Of, of the security doors on, you know, to the cockpit of a plane on September the tenth, two thousand and one. The security doors to the cockpit of a plane in two thousand and one weren't very secure. Now imagine you went to the airline industry and said, you know what, you guys need secure cockpit cockpit, cockpit doors on your planes because it would, you know just be better for you. The airline industry would say, uh, I don't think so. There's no risk of anyone busting into the cockpit and, and doing bad things to our airline. I think Cheryl's suggesting that, yes, or, you know, we are exposing ourselves to a black swan. Um, we've seen them in Bermuda in the past, 
and it looks like you know we're just waiting for another one to happen with respect to energy and or with respect to food. Well, I have to interrupt the conversation. It's been good, very good day. An hour's <laughs> flown by plus. <laughs> and uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up here, Craig? Final thoughts. Um, we, we, this, this budget, I think, is an example of short-term thinking. I would have preferred uh, for us to run a, a deficit this year, keep the sinking fund where it was, continue to contribute to the sinking fund, admit to the world that you know, we're, going, we're going to balance our budget next year. In fact, we're going to have a surplus and have uh, done the things that we need to do to produce a meaningful surplus in, in 2020. By meaningful, I'm, uh, I'm suggesting something north of, say, $75 million, rather than uh, give the pretense that we've achieved a surplus in 2019. Okay. Cheryl? I agree with um, Craig. Um, I think $75 million, though, is, uh, is a little... Um, Ambitious? Ambitious, yes. And I'm an ambitious guy. <laughs> but I I would add to that, I would like I would have liked foresight in the budget um, of going five, ten, twenty years. This again saying this is what uh, where we're we're headed. Um, instead of we're waiting till next year. It's just every three hundred and sixty five days. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I want a full a real plan in place to go forward. Um, I do like in this budget um, what they've done with education. I want them, but I want again. They stopped just short of where they needed to go. I like that. Um, I like that they're. I mean, it is lip service towards um, a, a, a a living wage. Um, I'm, we can't do it. We can't do it now. We're not going to be able to do it next year. Um, but maybe. But it's some. It's something we should aspire to. Um, and we do need aspirational goals, um, and so I do like that. Um, again, the health care, um, we can't afford to put in a, a national health care um, program right now. But how can we, on, on the other mm -hmm. hand, how can we not afford to do that? Mm -hmm. People can't afford health care. Um, but again, aspirational. Um, and so to that extent, I like that with, um, with this. Um, with this, but I, I agree 100% with Mr. Doom and Gloom over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Craig Simmons and Cheryl Packwood and Cordell Riley, who's with us in the first half hour. Uh, I'm Don Burgess for Burr News, and we appreciate you tuning in and watching uh, the show today. And we'll be back next week, and we're going to be talking about. Uh, belongers and UK voting rights and other immigration issues. For all of us here at Bernie's, we wish you a beautiful afternoon. <laughs>